when you're talking about social media, it comes down to two critical parts and they have to play together is one, are you stopping through pattern interruption? Are you stopping and earning the click on YouTube? Or are you stopping and earn, uh, stopping the scroll on the other platforms? That's the first part. Without it, you never get to your content, you never get to your message, you never get to your call to action. So it's critically important. But Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the show where world's renowned thought leaders and best-selling authors share their wisdom and insight to help you achieve your goals and be super productive. If you're new to this channel, then do consider subscribing for your weekly dose of knowledge, inspiration, and motivation. This episode is being recorded in association with Let's Localize, an organization with a mission to foster micro contributions from communities and businesses to support schools for their need of time, skill, and money. I'm your host, Ajay Mathur, and my guest today is a best-selling author, speaker, and entrepreneur who helps Fortune 500 firms and celebrities find and engage with their audiences. He is a digital marketing guru who has achieved 1 million followers in 30 days in 100 countries on Facebook as well as on Instagram separately, and has also written a best selling book on the same topic 1 million followers. He has served as a vice president of digital for Paramount Pictures and helped many notable firms such as Disney, Fox, CNBC, Netflix, Xbox, LinkedIn, just to name a few. Not just companies, but he has also worked as a digital strategist for celebrities such as Taylor Swift, Rihanna, Adriana Lima, and many more. His work has been featured in prestigious media outlets such as Inc., Entrepreneur, Mindvalley, Fox Business, and so on. So let's welcome the author of his second best-selling book, Hook Point, which I have just finished cover to cover. It looks like this. Hook Point, How to Stand Out in a Three-Second World the author of the book, Brandon Kane. Brandon, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to connect with you and everybody that's watching this. Thank you very much. So my, my first question is about your inspiration and to get 1 million followers. Most of the people, especially young people, when they think about social media, they just want to have more and more followers, but for no proper reason. But you actually made it a, a business, really. And You've written a book about it and you advise the businesses to achieve the similar kind of goals. So just tell me your why and why did you get so deep into this? Well, it was really to show people what is possible. So you know, a lot of the work that we do and it's you know, articulated in the second book, Hook Point, is we look for different ways to help people stand out and also messages stand out so that you can really transform the world in a positive way. And one of my, my core beliefs is that uh, there are people all over the world that have ability to transform it with their product, their service, their message or content, whatever it may be. They just don't have the tools or the know how to do it. So the, the experiment of generating a million followers in 30 days was the hook uh, to start a larger conversation to give people what they truly need to be successful in today's world. So what is this three second world? Tell us a little bit more about how, why, why our attention span has gone so short and where well, this rule comes from. Well, I mean, it's the fact that there's 60 billion messages sent out on digital platforms each day is the world that we live in. It's, it's no longer that you're competing against your direct competition. You're competing against every piece of content for that attention. So you're competing against LeBron James, you're competing against Netflix and Paramount or Kevin Hart, all of these people. And because individuals are inundated with so much content every single day is they have to prioritize their attention. And it's not just them that has to prior prioritize their attention, but it's also the algorithms which dictate which content is seeded to us versus which content isn't. So if, if a piece of content is not capturing your attention, meaning um, it, you're not stopping the scroll, you're not earning a click, then it teaches the algorithms that, hey, this content's not going to hold attention, so we're going to deprioritize it for other content. Um, and that's really where that three-second rule comes in. It's one of the ratios that we use as we look at the reach of a post to the number of people or the number of views that it generates. Like in a view today, in today's world is counted at three seconds. So that's kind of where it comes up with is like years ago, 
advertisers were up in arms when they found out they were getting ch charged at the one second mark on you know a video view ad because that doesn't really show intent. So they pushed it back to, to three seconds. And again, we use that as one of our primary ratios to determine whether or not you know the content is working, whether it's going to go viral, whether it's going to hit our key cores and objectives. So uh, just to, to kind of recap that is we live in a world where there's so much content, where so much content is pushed, and you have a very, very short period of time to win that attention, to, to win the first part of the conversation. And it is very different than your mission statement or your USP, right? It, most of the time, yes, it can be your USP, but most of the time it's not. Like I'll give you an example of when it is like Instacart groceries delivered in less than an hour. Mm -hmm. That's their USP and their hook point. But a majority of them like Disney it's you know, their USP is bringing families together through experiences and, and content. That's not really their hook. Like for Disney, their hook is their movies, is their characters, is their intellectual property. So, um, you know, that's why they acquired Pixar. That's why they acquired Marvel Studios because the Avengers or the new movie Soul that just came out, that's their hook into their brand. And uh, you, you mentioned about algorithm checking the hook points and that's more relevant to YouTube rather than Facebook, right? So Facebook, as you mentioned in the book, is a sharing sort of platform which grows with sharing versus uh, YouTube, which is based on the algorithm. So when they're all based on algorithm, it's just Facebook, you can overcome certain aspects of the algorithm if people are sharing it, but they're all heavily dependent on an algorithm like Facebook, for example, uh, even though it has sharing, you don't get the content. People can't share it if they don't see the content. So the algorithm has to play into that factor. So it's, it's kind of ingrained in all social platforms. So when you say three seconds, this is more towards the video kind of content or it is also uh, anything events too. So how, how would it work in a, let's say if you have a Facebook post, so it's like you, when you're scrolling, you're stopping there for three seconds or less or. Yeah, it's, it's the algorithms have one job and one job only. It's mm -hmm. to keep people on the platform longer because that's how these platforms make money. And even if it's an image post or an article, they're measuring the amount of time that you're, you're spending with that piece of content. So the longer you're spending with that piece of content, whether it's a video, an image, an article, will dictate the amount of reach it gives you. Now, that's why oftentimes you'll see videos can get far more reach than you know, a traditional image or an article post. I'm not saying that those can't get reached. They can but that's where you'll see videos that can generate hundreds of millions of views. And on like YouTube, for example, it's billions of views because they're holding that attention longer. But again, with an article or an image, it, again, how long are you spending with that piece of content? So three seconds is uh, for a YouTube video, it's a really, really short amount of time and we have to structure. I mean, we have to use the best possible way those three seconds. So you mentioned- well, with YouTube, it's, YouTube is thumbnail and headline. That's what you're looking to earn or win in the first three seconds. A majority of traffic for YouTube is coming off that suggested videos. Mm -hmm. So when you're watching a video the, on the right-hand side, you'll see suggested videos. That's the thumbnail and headline serves as those first three seconds is how do I construct that hook around that thumbnail and headline to get somebody to click. Uh, yeah. So you mentioned about a five-step kind of framework to create your hook point. Can you get, give us a, some high-level overview of that? Yeah, we, can, we can't go super deep into it because we don't have enough time, but yeah. at a very high level, you know, the first place you want to start is references, is, is what is working in the marketplace, what is not working in the marketplace. So many people skip this step and just start creating content or creating hooks without really studying what's happening in the world. And we do this from uh, a positive and a negative. So one of the easiest steps that you can do is just start making a notebook or a Google Doc what are the products you buy? What are the ads you click on? What is the content that you share? And start dissecting, well, what was the hook that got you to perform that action? And then you can use that as a starting point for yourself. So like, let's just say you bought a book and because the title captured your attention. Now, how can you take that title and play around with it to put your product, your service, your words into it 
as a learning exercise. On the flip side, what are ads or billboards or TV shows or, or books or products that you don't buy, that don't capture your attention? This one's a little bit trickier because we're automatically just zoning out and moving on to the next thing and the next thing. But it's critically important to stop and look at it and study why isn't this working? Why, why didn't this capture my attention? And like one simple exercise that we'll do is we'll pull up like Instagram, an Instagram page on desktop and we'll scroll over all the posts and we'll get benchmarks of, okay, what's high performer, what's low performer. Or like YouTube, we'll do the same is like high performers. It's super easy. You'll go like, you'll sort the videos of a page by most popular. Um, then we'll go back to the newest, uh, sort by newest. And then we'll just see again, like well, what are the low performers versus the high performers and dissect them against each other so that we can learn. And then eventually you'll get to a place where you start really learning what works and what doesn't. And then you can start crafting your own. And one of the exercises I give people is to visualize uh, that an editor of a magazine, the magazine you've always dreamed of, of being on in your specific niche calls you and says, we want to put you on the cover. You're going to be the only person on this cover but what is that headline, that text that you want us to represent your brand, your product or service? And when coming up with that, just envision your core customer walking down a busy street, passing a magazine stand. And we've all seen magazine stands before. There's 50 or 100 different ones up there. What is that headline that's going to make your core audience that you're trying to attract stop, pick yours out amongst a busy street, pick it up, buy it and read it? Because that's how difficult the world is that we live in today. Yeah. But when we're suggesting to do that, don't come up with one. Come up with 10, 15, 20 different ideas. And once you've hit your creative limit, push yourself even further to see what comes up. Because so oftentimes when we push ourselves beyond our creative, uh, creative limits, that's when the best ideas can come from. And then finally, refine that and test it. And testing could come in many ways, shape, or form. It can come in asking friends, asking business partner, colleagues, doing a simple survey monkey and send, um, survey and sending it out to people. Or you can go to a very deep level, like the strategies that we broke down in the 1 million followers book, where you're using social platforms to test and get data back and scale. But testing is such a critical uh, part because oftentimes what people do is they'll come up with one title or one hook, they'll fall in love with it without testing it. And then they put all this time, resources, and energy into it, and then it falls flat. So when we are talking about the testing, right, in YouTube's terms, if I think, you're talking about creating different thumbnails and different titles and then test them, like you put one on the same video, use one thumbnail title, and then use it for a few days and then change it to use it for a few days. Is it what you're suggesting? Well, again, there's different ways that you can test. You can test offline, you can test online. The biggest thing is, are you testing and are you learning? Yes, YouTube is one aspect of testing a thumbnail and headline uh, where you can test it automatically using YouTube's features as one part of the test is to test the hook and whether that is working. But when you're talking about social media, it comes down to two critical parts and they have to play together. Is one, are you stopping through pattern interruption, are you stopping and earning the click on YouTube or are you stopping and earn, uh, stopping the scroll on the other platforms? That's the first part. Without it, you never get to your content, you never get to your message, you never get to your call to action. So it's critically important. But we're not talking about clickbait here. You can't just earn the click, earn the attention and trick people and not hold it, mm. which comes into the second is how long can you hold that attention for? The longer you can hold that attention, the more success that you're going to have. So those two have to play in together to be successful on social platforms in the world that we find ourselves in today. And you mentioned about uh, don't let your viewers think for three seconds, not just three seconds, but for the entire duration of your video. Uh, I found that quite fascinating. What exactly does that mean you're not letting your viewers think? Well, I'm not saying it for the entire thing. What I'm saying is when you're trying to earn attention for the first three seconds is you don't want to make people think too hard, but at the same time, you don't want to make people think too little is you want to have that sweet spot in between. But once you have their attention, then you can take them wherever you want. And that's where you can make them think. But most people go wrong 
is they're trying so much. They're, they're, they're designing their content or their message like they already have the attention. So I talk a lot about the difference between need and want. Mm. Most people with their message or their service or their product, they have a fundamental need that they believe is going to improve somebody's life in any way, shape, or form. And that can be on a very deep level, like personal transformation work, or it can be at service level, like a cool product. Uh, but uh, if you start too deep, you start where the, the you start with the need. The consumer may not be there yet. They may not know they need that. Versus starting with the want. So let me give you an example. It's like my book, One Million Followers. Is I'm starting with the want. People want followers. But what I know is that they need to be successful on social media is to understand how to test content, how to create shareable content, the psychology of communication, uh, the importance of strategic partnerships and alliances. But if I would have started with one of those, like, for example, if I would have started like the social media guide to A-B testing at scale, could I grab some attention? Sure. But would it work on the level that 1 million followers did? No. So I started with the want to bring them to the need. But most people will start with the need. They go too deep, too fast. And then it just overwhelms people or they don't get it. They get misunderstood. And then you, uh, you lose them right away. And doesn't that relate with the process communication model, which you talked about, uh, I think, in detail? And uh, you talk about different people speak different languages. So you have to address that. How do you incorporate all of that? Because that's quite a lot of information uh, for me. So how do you put that together? Can you give us some example where you have kind of considered the the model as in different people have different needs and wants and thinkings and some are logical, some are emotional, et cetera. Yeah, it is a lot. Like this is to be successful as we want when it's very simple. So you, you stop, you win the tension, you hold the attention, but it's not necessarily easy. There's many factors in how to be successful in that. And the process communication model, which you brought up is one of the tools that we use to get people to stop and to hold that attention. And what it does is it identifies that people perceive the world differently. Mm -hmm. They perceive the world in six different ways. Now we have access to all six, but typically we rely on one or two as our base. So there's people that perceive the world with thoughts and logic. There's people that perceive the world through feelings and emotions. There's people that perceive the world through values and opinions. Some people is like uh, humor and fun. Um, there's people that just reflect on the world. They just take things in and stare off into space and reflect on everything that's happening around them. And then there's people that just act. They just don't, don't feel, they don't think, they just go. Like Tom Cruise in Mission Impossible, perfect example. He's always running. He's never sitting down and, and thinking through things. So what does that look like? Well, for example, we're working with one of the largest real estate companies in the world right now. So we're working with a lot of different uh, real estate agents and typically the, the communication around real estate is one-sided. It's, you know, the thoughts and logic. It's this place has three bedroom, 1200 square feet, and it's X number of dollars. Mm -hmm. The problem with that is it only reaches 25% of the world's population. So how do we change the dynamic? Okay, well, with the process communication model, we focus on three. So thoughts and logic, which we just covered, um, uh, feelings, how does it make you feel, and then fun. So it's facts, feelings, fun. Those three together represent 75%. So going back to that real estate example, let's say we were creating a piece of content or an ad, we may say something like, you know, this place has three bedrooms and 1,200 square feet and it's $1,200. And when you get this house, you're going to feel so good when your family's sitting around the kitchen table around Thanksgiving and just imagine what it's going to feel like around Christmas when you're sitting around this fireplace and you can host all these fam this family. And did you see the backyard with that pool? You are going to have so much fun because you're going to throw the best parties and it's going to be crazy. Everybody's going to admire you and think you are the coolest, funnest person. So there we just contextualized what we were selling through these different ways that people perceive the world. We didn't change the content of the house. We just contextualize it. So those different, you know, these three ways that people perceive the world that is represents 75% could, 
could hear it, could connect with it. So we have a better chance of making the sale or engaging the audience. Mm, so it's linking our product or services to the desired kind of audience and try to capture as much you can based on this fun feeling and um, effect. I really like Yeah, because most so, people, when they're designing content, they're speaking to themselves. They're not thinking about the other person, the other side of the table, the other person on the side of the screen or the million people on the other side of the screen. And that's where a lot of people typically go wrong with content. And you know, the process communication model is just one way that we go about doing it. Uh, but it, it, the most important thing is really put yourself in the person's shoes on the other side of the table, the other side of the screen when you're constructing your message. Mm. Yeah. And you mentioned about uh, subverting expectations and I get confused with that. Sometimes if I put a thumbnail in case of YouTube, for example, and that thumbnail, whatever is written in that is only discussed in a very um, short part of the entire video. Is it not considered clickbait then? Or where do you define only, the boundary that, you know, what is... Not yeah, it's a great question. Clickbait. It's only consider clickbait if your story doesn't match the headline, if you're tricking people with it. So for example, mm -hmm. uh, we had a, for example, if we're constructing an ad for a meditation app or a meditation retreat, meditation has been around for thousands of years. You type it into Google, there's billions of results that come up and people will say the same thing in the same way. Every time meditation is the key to stillness or key to contentment or releasing anxiety. The minute I see a headline like that, I already know what it's going to say because I've heard it. I've read it before. Now it may be a completely different take, but you're not winning that attention. So subverting expectations, a tool that we use sometimes by flipping an unknown held consumption on its head. So with going back to that meditation example, we may say something like meditation is a scam. Now, it would be clickbait if the story didn't tie into that. So the story that I may tell about that is, hey, have you ever really felt like meditation just hasn't worked for you? Almost like it's a scam. Well, if that's you, I feel your pain. Because when I first started, people were telling me I just sit down and clear my mind. But every time I did that, I tried to clear my mind, my mind would race with thoughts. Until one day I took this course with a uh, Zen Buddhist monk who taught me these three principles that I'm going to share with you today that allowed me as a non-meditator to meditate every single day for the past 12 years. Okay. So let's dive in and, and break down these three strategies. Mm. So again, it's not clickbait because I'm using that subverting of expectations to, t to tie into the story that I'm telling to represent why I started with that headline. But if I went on a completely different tangent, then yes, it is clickbait. Yeah, got it. That's quite useful. And um, well, I do have a lot many questions, but I'm just looking at the watch also. Uh, there is, there's one thing that you talk about uh, hook point fatigue, right? So when people are looking at it, you just have to keep refining yourself. Tell us a little bit more about that. How, when do you have to change your strategy? Well, I'll give you the perfect example is Tom shoes hmm. had one of the best hooks of one for one. You buy a pair of Tom shoes and they give one to a, you know, somebody in need that doesn't have shoes. Amazing hook point, but it was so good that everybody started copying it. Everybody started doing one for one. And Tom's failed to innovate and create additional hooks and new hooks, which caused them to flounder. Now they're still around, but they're not the success that they, they have today. So fatigue, hook fatigue comes in when people start copying it, or it's just become oversaturated, or it's just not no longer relevant. So that's where it's like with the book and just the framework is it's designed not to do it once. It's to, it's to ingrain in the DNA of everything that you do so that you can always be at the cutting edge. You can always, no matter what your competition does, stand out. No matter what the algorithms do, stand out. No matter where the world shifts, stand out because you're nimble. Again, it's not changing your foundation. It's not changing your mission. It's not changing your why or your content. 
it's changing the way that you bring people into the deeper level conversation that you want to have with them. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, and what other strategy, I mean, your content has to be great in order to hold people, but how would you, because all YouTube videos not watched hundred percent, right? People do leave after two minutes, three minutes, five minutes. What are your, some tips so that you can let user give the maximum retention on your content? Well, one of the one of the tools that specifically YouTube that they use is called the Jenga effect. And if you've ever played Jenga, it's the, the game where you pull out the blocks and then you get to a point where the, all the blocks are going and it falls over. So you know what is happening. It's it's going to fall. And with each block, the tension builds, but it doesn't fall till the end. Mm. So that's a tool. It's like Graham Stephan. Uh, he's a YouTuber, very successful he did a video on how he generate got a Tesla for $78 a month. And he, st- he doesn't get into the math until like nine minutes in, but he's building the story and he's not, he's doing it on purpose, but he's not doing it for the sake of doing it. He's playing into the overall story, building, 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 building to the reveal. Cause that builds retention of the video, which shows the algorithms that people are spending longer and longer time with it. So that's one tool of being successful with content. So it's, it's all about just building retention is, is building your story, your storytelling um, techniques and skill set to, to get better at that. Yeah. Coming to storytelling and uh, digital uh, marketing. Uh, I have a lot of questions, but this is going to be my last one in the interest of time. I ask one question, everybody, all my guests, that what are three skills that you believe are required in order to grow, but schools are not teaching them? Uh, Could you tell me if something comes at the top of your head? Well, first and foremost, how do you grab attention? Hmm. That that's the, the biggest thing. Number two is the mindset to being successful is is understanding what failure actually represents is not a bad thing but as a positive thing uh and it's a learning and stepping stone and and three is experience is getting out there and doing stuff i uh, it's like uh, reading a book only takes you so far y- y- you can't really understand business by going to business school you understand business by creating business you don't understand film by going to film school. You understand film by creating films. Now, I'm not saying that there's not some value in it, but there's more practical uh, applications of actually going out there, doing trial and error that really drives success. Yeah, couldn't agree more. I totally agree with you. Just do it if you really want to get good at something. Okay, so Brandon, you've you've written two best-selling books. Uh, What next in your uh, goal list? Uh, well, right now we're focusing on getting the the second book out uh, into the world, and we built a consulting firm around it to help people develop their hook points. There's an idea for a third book, but we're we're holding off on it right now. We don't know when we're going to get started with it, but yeah, we've got a lot on our plate right now. Okay, great. All the best with the book, and finally, how where can people reach you? Uh, they, if they want to learn more about the book, they can go to hookpoint.com. Uh, or connect with me on Instagram by messaging me, messaging me at Brendan Kane. Thank you very much, guys. If you are looking to reach that one million followers in well, not in a month, but uh, there is a lot of uh, stuff that you, uh, Brendan has written in the book Hook Point. I've re- read it cover to cover. It's quite a lot of case studies and examples. Please go check out. It's going to add definitely some value to you. And if you've not yet done so, and this video added something to you, then please do consider subscribing to this channel. I will see you again next week. And thank you very much, Brendan, for coming here and giving your precious time. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks a lot.